Hello everyone, my name is Jennifer Pate and I'm the Scholarly Communications Librarian at the University of North Alabama in Florence, Alabama. And on behalf of the NASIG Continuing Education Committee, I welcome you to our October webinar, Designing for Accessibility, presented by Melissa Green. Before the presentation, I have a few quick announcements. First, this webinar is being recorded and anyone who registered for the webinar will receive a link recording by email shortly after the webinar. If you have any questions for Melissa during the presentation, please enter them into the WebEx Q&A box located in the lower right corner of the WebEx window, not in the chat. If you can't see the Q&A box, click on the Q&A icon in the WebEx window and it should open and appear in the lower right corner. Uh, Melissa will take all of your questions. I'll be keeping notes Come along to her at the end of the presentation. When the webinar is over, you'll be re redirected to a survey about the webinar. I hope that you'll take a few minutes to fill it out. Let us know how we're doing, what we can do better. And if you have any ideas for future webinars, we'd love to hear them. And with that, I'm going to introduce our speaker for today. Melissa Green is a teacher, librarian, technology enthusiast, and an IAAP certified professional in accessibility core competencies. A technology accessibility specialist with the University of Alabama Center for Instructional Technology helps to ensure that technology users, including those with disabilities, have a functional and accessible technology experience with the university's web presence and instructional and emerging technologies. Melissa holds a Master of Education in Curriculum and Instruction with a con concentration in assistive technology from George Mason University and MLIS from the University of Alabama. Melissa embraces technology's potential to foster access and inclusion for all, a perspective informed by her work in the disability community, libraries, and information technology. I'm thrilled that she is able to be here and present with us today, and I'm going to hand it over to her right now. Thanks, Melissa. Thank you so much. Right. Good morning and thank you all so much for being here this morning. As Jennifer mentioned, I am Melissa Green. I'm a technology accessibility training specialist with the Center for Instructional Technologies Technology Accessibility Team at the University of Alabama. The Center for Instructional Technology is a unit of the university's Office of Information Technology. And our group works to ensure that everyone, including those with disabilities, can access and use the university's websites and the technologies we use for teaching, learning, and the business of the university. Uh, you can find more information about our efforts on our website at accessibility.ua.edu. Technology accessibility is a passion of mine, and I'm very happy to have an opportunity to talk with you about just one aspect of that today. From online course materials to documents and presentations, we all share some responsibility when it comes to creating accessible content. Today's session will provide a brief introduction to designing for accessibility. We'll talk about the importance of accessible design, as well as high impact practices you as digital content creators can apply to create documents, images, audio, video, and web content accessible to users of all abilities. Um, with that, we'll get started. First, the case for accessibility. The power of the web is in its universality. Access by everyone, regardless of disability, is an essential aspect. This quote from Tim Berners-Lee, Dr. Tim Berners-Lee, the inventor of the World Wide Web, really sums up for me what this technology accessibility stuff is all about, and that's equal access and opportunity. Access to information and communications is also a basic human right, according to the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. Just who are we talking about when we talk about disability, and who are we leaving out when we fail to design for accessibility? Figures from the World Health Organization indicate that about 15% of the world's population lives with some form of disability. 
In the United States Census Bureau's latest American Community Survey, an estimated 13% of the U.S. population reported a disability. And the latest data from the U.S. Department of Education indicate that 11% of undergraduates at degree-granting post-secondary institutions report having a disability. We have to be careful with statistics. They often rely on self-reporting. Uh, many students don't register with disability services for a multitude of reasons. And the definitions of disability vary across instruments, uh, making it hard to make comparisons. Also, the disability experience is diverse and deeply personal and can't be adequately counted uh, just by looking at numbers. However, the statistics can give us a bit of an idea of just how many people we leave out when we fail to ensure our projects are accessible, and it is quite a few. Designing for accessibility benefits everyone, though, and not just people with disabilities. There's a significant overlap between making digital materials accessible for mobile device users and people with disabilities. Some of the ways in which we see this play out, both someone using their mobile phone in bright sunlight and someone who is colorblind may have difficulty perceiving color. Both the smartphone owner attempting to watch a video in a very noisy environment or a very quiet one, and the deaf or hard of hearing user may be unable to hear the audio track. In both cases, improving access for one benefits the other. While accessibility and usability aren't the same thing, everyone can benefit from intuitive and consistent interactions and elements and accessible web content is generally more usable accessibility also increases findability and search engine optimization proper heading structure and descriptive link text are beneficial to both accessibility and search engine optimization or seo the alternative text that's used to describe images and transcripts and captions provided for multimedia expose online content to search engines. Um, and you've experienced this if you've ever used Google image search, for example. Among other things, Google uses the alternative text descriptions for images to help determine the best results to return. If those reasons are not compelling enough for you, um, you might consider this, that in many cases, accessibility is required by law. If you live in the United States, applicable laws include the Americans with Disabilities Act, or ADA, and the Rehabilitation Act of 1973, specifically sections 504 and 508. The ADA is comprehensive civil rights legislation it protects people with disabilities from discrimination in public services, programs, and activities. And while the ADA doesn't explicitly address web accessibility, it does require that state and local governments and businesses and nonprofit organizations that serve the public communicate with people with disabilities as effectively as with people without disabilities. Um, this has actually recently been in the news in um, a case against Domino's Pizza. Um, the Supreme Court declined to hear the case, uh, essentially upholding a lower court's order that the ADA um, applies to web accessibility, even though it doesn't explicitly address it. The Rehabilitation Act prohibits discrimination on the basis of disability in programs conducted by federal agencies, uh, but also in programs receiving federal financial assistance in federal employment, and in the employment practices of federal contractors. The portions of the Rehab Act relevant to accessibility are Section 504, which states that programs or activities receiving federal money must not discriminate on the basis of disability, and Section 508, which requires that information technology procured or used by the federal government be accessible to people with disabilities, including employees and members of the public. In higher education, additional laws and requirements apply. In 2010, in response to a complaint filed by the National Federation of the Blind, 
U.S. Department of Justice entered into a settlement with colleges and universities that had been using the Kindle e-reader as part of a pilot study with Amazon. At the time, the Kindle was inaccessible to students who were blind um, because the menu and the control features of the device did not include text-to-speech functionality. Additionally, a lot of the electronic content that the colleges and universities were providing via the Kindle was not accessible. In a subsequent Dear Colleague letter to colleges and universities, the U.S. Departments of Justice and Education stated that requiring the use of emerging technology that is inaccessible to students with disabilities constitutes discrimination under Section 504 and the ADA and reminded us uh, colleges and universities of our responsibility to ensure students have equal access to technologies used for teaching and learning. Colleges and universities are now charged with planning for accessible technology tools, services, and information, just as we are charged with providing academic accommodations and ensuring uh, the physical accessibility of our spaces. So what do we mean when we say that technology must be accessible? U.S. Department of Education Office for Civil Rights Policy Guidance defines accessible as follows, and I'm reading from the policy guidance here. Accessible means a person with a disability can acquire the same information, engage in the same interactions, and enjoy the same services as a person without a disability in an equally effective and equally integrated manner with substantially equivalent ease of use. In other words, the person with a disability must be able to obtain the information as fully, equally, and independently as a person without a disability. Most of the digital content we create can be made fully accessible, and we should strive to do that. I mean, you've demonstrated your interest in doing that by your participation today. But sometimes it is the case that we must use a technology that is not fully accessible to users with disabilities. Um, perhaps it's the only uh, product or service available um, and it's not fully accessible. If we must use a technology not fully accessible, we have to ensure that equally effective alternative access to that information will be provided. And that's um, accessibility in short. Two sets of standards and guidelines are most commonly used to determine if digital content is accessible. The standards specified in Section 508 of the Rehabilitation Act, which apply to technology procured or used by the federal government, and the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. The Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, or WCAG, are international guidelines developed by the World Wide Web Consortium, or W3C, the governing body of the web, and serve as the basis for most web accessibility law in the world. Uh, version 2.0 of these guidelines is based on four guiding principles of accessibility, perceivable, operable, understandable, and robust. WCAG 2.0 consists of three priority levels that act as an industry standard, with A being the minimum level of conformance and AAA being the level of conformance that ensures access to the greatest number of people. So if your content confirms with, with, conforms with A, it's accessible to many. If it conforms with AAA, it's accessible to most. Um, AA is, is somewhere in between. I've been talking about WCAG 2.0 because it is the basis of most current web accessibility policy, um, including my own universities. But those of you who have previously engaged in accessibility work may be aware that WCAG 2.1 was released last year. Uh, 2.1 extends 2.0 by improving accessibility guidance for uh, three groups of users. That's users with cognitive or learning disabilities, users with low vision, and users with disabilities on mobile devices. 
Um, it is backwards compatible with WCAG 2.0, meaning that web pages that conform to 2.1 also conform to 2.0. Let's talk a bit more about WCAG's principles of perceivable, operable, and understandable and robust. Um, they are collectively known by an acronym as POOR. Perceivable content is presented in a way that can be accessed with more than one sense. For example, a user who is blind can use screen reader software to hear the information in web pages and documents read aloud. Similarly, a user who is deaf can turn on closed captions or access a transcript for a visual representation of the audio in a podcast or a video. In each case, the information can be accessed in a way that makes it perceivable with more than one sense, um, hearing and sight. Operable content provides flexible navigation options and can be accessed with a variety of input methods. For example, uh, learners with visual impairments may not be able to use a mouse to select options on the screen. But if the digital content is marked up correctly with descriptive headings, they can navigate it with their screen readers using a number of keyboard shortcuts or touch gestures. Understandable content behaves in an intuitive, logical, and predictable way. Uh, for example, using plain language and providing consistent navigation uh, allows users to focus more of their energy and attention on the content rather than uh, navigation. And finally, robust content works across browsers and devices. Uh, following HTML and CSS standards is key to constructing robust content that is functional across assistive technologies, but also other technologies. Um, so this would also provide for functionality across different browsers or across PCs and Macs or both on a desktop um, and a mobile device. So how can we create content that people of all abilities can perceive operate and understand and that works across a range of technologies. Uh, that's a pretty tall order. There's no way we can address the entire diversity of the disability experience and the range of available technologies during the rest of our time together. Um, but we're going to focus on a few very impactful practices you can start implementing right now, no matter what type of digital content you're working with. Microsoft Office documents, PDFs, images, websites, videos, or even email messages. First, organize your content using headings and lists. A key digital accessibility principle is helping the user navigate to relevant content. Headings and lists add structure and meaning to documents and web pages by labeling each content part and indicating the order and relative importance of those parts. In order for your documents and web content to be accessible, it's important that you organize your content using true headings and lists. Someone who doesn't have full use of their vision can't see larger or bold font used to indicate titles, headings, or subheadings but they can perceive the appropriate markup and use it to navigate through a document or web page with their screen reader or other assistive technology like a switch or a mouth stick um, used to access and control a computer or smartphone. You want to use true headings rather than simply changing the font, um, enlarging the font size, and making the text that you want to be perceived as a title or a heading bold. This slide depicts a document that includes headings added via the styles function in Microsoft Word. In Microsoft Word, a quick way to see if your document includes appropriate heading styles is to turn on the navigation pane. If headings are missing or improperly nested, you can use the styles options in Word to fix them. Looking at web content where we most frequently see this go astray is using text formatting like font size, color, or weight to give the visual appearance of headings 
rather than using actual headings and other styles. This slide includes a screenshot of the WordPress visual editor. Uh, WordPress is a content management system used by many entities, including libraries. The author of this WordPress page or post has applied some built-in WordPress styles. In this case, uh, heading two and heading three. When the styles are applied, the visual appearance of the text does change, most notably the font size, but more importantly, structural markup is added that allows assistive technology users to navigate through the content more effectively. Another common mistake is using headings to achieve visual results. So marking something that doesn't actually function as a heading as a heading because you like the look of it or using the various heading levels out of order because you prefer how uh, they appear. If you want your level three heading to look more like a level two heading, you can accomplish this with CSS classes. This slide also illustrates that lists convey a hierarchical content structure, not just visual formatting. There's a difference in how assistive technology accesses a true list rather than just bullet symbols or numbers. Um, unordered lists, which usually appear as bullets, should be used when there's no order of sequence or importance. If you could reorder the content and it would have the same meaning, um, you might use an unordered list. Ordered lists, which usually appear as numbers or letters, suggest a progression or sequence. You can also add headings and lists to the HTML code itself. The example on this slide shows the same content as the previous slide marked up with HTML heading tags. That's the H2s and H3s. And the HTML ordered list and list item tags. That's the OLs and the LIs. You wanna find out what options for headings and lists are available in the tools you use to create digital content and put them to use. That might be Microsoft Office. It might be uh, the Google suite of authoring tools, uh, WordPress, Drupal, OU Campus, another content or collection management system. Investigate the options that are there for headings and lists um, so that you can apply them when you create your digital content. Adding alternative text or alt text for images is also a fundamental principle of digital accessibility. Alternative text provides a textual alternative to non-text content in documents and web pages and serves several functions. It's read by screen readers in place of images, allowing the content and the function of the image to be accessible to screen reader users. And those screen reader users might be people who are blind or have low vision. Um, they might be people who have certain cognitive or learning disabilities. They might be people who uh, simply prefer to hear information read aloud rather than reading it visually or learn better or perceive the information better when they hear it read aloud in addition to visually. So a wide group of users using screen readers, not just those with visual disabilities. Alternative text is also displayed in place of the image in browsers if the image file is not loaded or when the user has chosen not to view images. You might have experienced this when attempting to access a website um, using a limited data connection. Um, I see it a lot when I'm checking my email and Outlook for security purposes when images aren't loaded. The alternative text is displayed instead. Um, another instance in which alternative text comes into play is that it is read by search engines, um, which we talked about a little bit before with the Google image search results. Every image needs alternative text that provides an equivalent to the image content. Alternative text can be presented in two ways, and that's within the alt attribute of the image element when we're talking about HTML, or within the context or surroundings of the image itself. And alt text should present the content and function of an image and not necessarily just a description of its visual appearance. When determining appropriate alternative text for images, context is everything.
what's appropriate in one setting may be very different from what is appropriate in another. Let's say the image on this slide appears on a web page about new developments to the engineering building on a university campus. Uh, the picture on this slide depicts a postgraduate engineering student working in a new electron microscope lab. If the purpose of the image is to showcase the new buildings, technologies, and spaces, um, which would be a, a good reason to add it to a website, if that's its purpose, picture of a student or postgraduate engineering student will not convey the content and the function of the image effectively. In that context, the alt text, um, a postgraduate engineering student working in the new electron microscope lab might be more effective. Think about what the appropriate alt text might be if this same image appeared on the microscope manufacturer's website. It would probably be a little different going into more detail about the microscope versus who is using it and where. The same image, different description, depending on the context. You can create alt text for shapes, pictures, charts, tables, smart art graphics, and other objects in Office documents. In Microsoft Office 2016, the latest version of the desktop software many of us are using, uh, to do this, you right click on an image, select format picture or format object, and then select the alt text pane. And in the description box, you enter an explanation of the object. The process for adding alt text looks a little different in the Office 365 versions of Word, PowerPoint, Excel, and Outlook. To add alt text to visual content, like a picture or chart or other objects, you right click on that object and select alt text. Then you enter an explanation of the object in the text box on the alt text pane. There's even a feature that uses artificial intelligence to attempt to generate a description for you. If you don't like the results of that, you do have the ability to edit that description. If the image is decorative, you can indicate that by checking the mark as decorative box. So that's something you might wanna do um, with uh, a, a divider line or an image that's just there sort of to fill up space or provide visual punch but doesn't convey information. So you have the ability to mark it as decorative. I'm really looking forward to this rolling out to more versions of Office because I think it's much simpler and more straightforward. For web content, you can usually add alt text by editing the image details in a media library or when you add the image to a content or collection management system using the visual or WYSIWYG editor. This slide includes a screenshot of the image details box that appears when you edit an image in the WordPress visual editor, and it includes a field for entering alt text for an image. You can also add alt text to the HTML code itself this slide includes a screenshot of the WordPress HTML or text editor. The editor includes an image element uh, defining an image in an HTML page and the alt attribute of that element providing a description of the image that has been added. Again, just like with our um, other document and web content creation tools, we want to find out what options for alternative text are available in the tools you use and put them to use. And, and many of them do have the built-in ability to either type in alternative text in a designated field or to edit the HTML so the alternative text is provided in the alt attribute of the image element. If an image has no relevant content or function, um, if it's decorative, or if the alternative text um, is provided in nearby text, if the image has been sufficiently described in nearby text, then the image should have an empty or null alternative text value. When working in HTML, that's alt equals quote, quote, with no space in between. So open quote, quotation marks, close quotation marks, nothing in between. If an image is a link, uh, the alt text must describe the links function. 
When writing alt text, you can avoid words like picture of or image of or link to as the screen reader automatically provides this information. It identifies the content as an image or a link and announces that information to the user. And when writing your alt text, you should also use the fewest words necessary. I'm going to pause for a moment, take a sip of water. Next impactful practice addresses the use of color. When working with color, you need to make sure that color isn't your only method of conveying important information. This is primarily to ensure your content is accessible to people who have color vision deficiency, um, sometimes called color blindness, but it's also a principle of universal design for learning. By using more than just color to convey information, you're providing multiple means of representation. When using color, a good question to ask yourself is, could someone understand this content with the color removed? The first image on this slide is a map of the London Underground Rail System, where the various routes are distinguished only by the color of the lines. The second image on the slide is the same map, but with the color removed. When the color is removed, there's no way to tell which rail line is which or on which rail line a particular stop is located. One alternative to that is to annotate the graphic to distinguish between routes. Uh, this slide depicts part of a map of the DC metro system. Color is again used to indicate the routes, but there are also text indicators. At the end of each line, um, there's a circle with text indicating um, that it's the green line or the orange line and so on. Um, and that's effective because even if you and I perceive green differently, we both know what green looks like to us in the context of this map. Another strategy might be to use different patterns for the lines instead of colors, solid, dashed, dotted, and so on. Uh, this slide depicts a different transit map where this strategy is applied. One line is solid black, another is dotted black, another has just a black outline. Another approach is to use both color and pattern or color and text. I really like this approach in the context in which many of us work where the, we're putting together visual information like charts and graphs. This can easily be applied to something like a pie chart or a, a bar chart. Um, this slide depicts colored labels used in the Trello project management application. And when Trello's colorblind mode is enabled, a different pattern is added for each color, allowing users with color vision deficiencies to perceive differences among the labels. In order to be perceivable, your foreground color needs to be significantly different from the background color. The example on this slide is an image of text on a gray cloudy background. The text reads, be someone's sunshine when their skies are gray. And both the foreground text and background are shades of gray, except for the word sunshine, which is yellow. This combination is difficult for many of us to read, but it's especially challenging for users with low vision, as well as users in bright sunlight or someone attempting to view uh, the image in the back of a large lecture hall or in a room that's brightly lit or um, projected from a projector with insufficient uh, brightness. There are several tools you can use to check for sufficient contrast in the digital materials you create. Um, one of my favorites is the WebAIM Color Contrast Checker. It's a free online tool that lets you check to see if your color choices meet the contrast ratios specified by WCAG 2.0. And it also helps you pick color combinations that provide sufficient contrast. You enter the hexadecimal codes or web color codes for the background and foreground colors. And if your color combination fails to pass the test, you can adjust the lightness slider to modify the colors by slight degrees until you get a result that has sufficient contrast. Another one our team likes is the Paciello Group's Color Contrast Analyzer. Um, it's also freely available, uh, but it's desktop software that you install on your computer. 
It works both on the web and with documents and images uh, stored locally on your computer. You can enter color codes to check or use an eyedropper tool to select colors to check. There's also a very low tech way to see if color contrast is sufficient, and that's to print or recolor the content in question in grayscale. Another basic principle of digital accessibility is making sure links make sense out of context. By avoiding phrases like click here and more as link text. This is especially important because screen reader users often navigate from link to link, skipping the text in between. Or use a keyboard shortcut to view a list of all of the links present on the page. When you add a hyperlink to your content, Ask yourself, um, if you read the link text out of context, would you understand what the link is for and what clicking it will do? In the case of a link labeled here, or click here or more, um, when, if you come across that independently of context, you have no idea um, what that link does or what will happen when you click on it. You should also alert the user when the link leads to a non-HTML resource like a PDF, Word, or PowerPoint file. Um, you can do this in a number of different ways. One that's fairly popular is indicating the format of the content you're linking to in parentheses. Make sure the parenthetical information like PDF or PowerPoint is part of the actual link text and not unlinked text immediately following it. URLs as link text should generally be avoided unless the URL is relevant content. They're just not very friendly for a screen reader user to uh, perceive. The next principle addresses media accessibility. In order to ensure your audio and video content is accessible, you must provide captions, transcripts, and when necessary, audio descriptions. Captions are text that appear on a video to match its soundtrack, including dialogue and nonverbal sounds like thunder or dog barking. The screenshot on the left side of this slide shows a caption video playing in the YouTube player. Here, the captions appear in white text on a black background in the lower third of the video above the player controls. Transcript is a written record of a video or audio recording. It may or may not include descriptions of filler sounds like um or uh. An example of an NPR interview transcript is shown on the right side of the slide. Speakers are identified by their names and titles with their words transcribed exactly as the speaker says them. You can build captions from a transcript by breaking the text up into small segments called caption frames and synchronizing them with the media so that each caption frame can be displayed at the right time. We are often asked if automatic captions, such as those generated by YouTube or Facebook, are sufficient to meet accessibility requirements. The short answer to that is no. Um, captions must be synchronized with the media and accurately represent all the dialogue and sounds in the media, and automatic captions don't do that just yet. A lot of users in the disability and accessibility communities refer to automatic captions as craptions to give you an idea of their perceived quality. Um, however, you can start captioning your media by using automatic captioning. It provides you with something to work with from a basis. Um, but you have to review and edit those automatically generated captions for accuracy in order for them to be fully accessible. Depending on your video's content, audio descriptions may also be necessary. Audio descriptions narrate the visual parts of a video and are played in between the video's dialogue and other essential sounds. This slide includes two still shots of the YouTube video player, in the first, two hands are holding a tablet computer, and the associated audio description is, a man is using a tablet by voice. In the second, 
a hand is typing on a laptop keyboard and the associated audio description is a woman with her arm in a sling is typing on a keyboard. Audio descriptions are necessary for users with visual disabilities, but offer benefits for all. I recently discovered audio described content on Netflix and I'm really enjoying the ability to understand that with my eyes closed uh, when I have a migraine um, or if I'm attempting to fall asleep. If video is produced with accessibility in mind, then audio descriptions are often unnecessary. As long as visual elements within the video are described in the audio. Uh, for example, you don't need audio description for uh, talking heads only or for text on slides, as long as the slide text is woven into what you say. Uh, but you would need audio description of things like charts and diagrams shown on those slides. Let's move on to resources you can use to evaluate the accessibility of the digital content you create. Um, like the Microsoft Office spelling checker tells you about possible spelling errors, the accessibility checker in Word, PowerPoint, Excel, and Outlook on the web tells you about possible accessibility issues in your Office files. The tool generates a report of issues that could make your content difficult for people with disabilities to understand, um, explains why you should fix these issues, and how to fix them. In newer versions of Office, including Office 365, you can access the Accessibility Checker via the Review tab, right alongside the Spelling and Grammar tools. In older versions, you can access the Accessibility Checker by going to File, Info, Check for Issues, Check Accessibility. After running the Accessibility Checker, um, a panel will open in the right sidebar of the document or slideshow or spreadsheet um, that lists errors, warnings, and tips with explanations and how to fix recommendations for each. A screenshot of that accessibility checker inspection results panel appears on this slide. Adobe Acrobat Pro DC also offers tools to assist content authors in creating accessible PDFs. The Accessibility Checker Full Check, which is depicted in a screenshot on the left side of the slide, and the Make Accessible Action, which is depicted in a screenshot on the right side of the slide. The Full Check feature in Acrobat checks a PDF for many of the characteristics of accessible PDFs. You can choose which accessibility problems to look for and how you want the results reported. That generates a list of results. Um, there will be a visual and text status indicator indicating whether you passed um, or failed each item or whether the item requires manual review. You can right click on each of the items to either select fix and automatically address the accessibility issue or select Explain to access support documentation that addresses the issue. The Make Accessible action walks you through the steps required to make a PDF accessible. It prompts you to address accessibility issues, such as a missing document description or title. It looks for common elements that often need further action to be accessible like scanned text that needs to be converted to actual text using optical character recognition, form fields, tables, and images. I use both of these tools depending on the nature of the content I'm working with. Um, typically, I use the full check feature in the accessibility tool set when working with a document that I've created. So something that I have access to the source file, I've made every effort in the source file to ensure it's accessible as possible, and then I've generated a PDF. I'd use that accessibility full check feature to uh, check the accessibility of the resulting PDF and make any necessary tweaks. And there's usually one or two, even if you've been very diligent in the source document. This is a good time to note that it is significantly easier to address or prevent accessibility issues in a source file 
than it is in a resulting PDF. Um, if you contacted me and asked me to look at the accessibility of um, a PDF that you generated from InDesign or from Microsoft Word, the first thing I would ask is, can you please send me the Microsoft Word file or can you please send me the InDesign file? Um, again, it's usually much easier to address accessibility and the authoring tool than it is to go back and uh, remediate or correct in the PDF. I use the make accessible action when I don't have access to the source file um, or if I'm working with a more complex document, like a scanned document. Um, it again, kind of walks you through step by step what you would need to do to address accessibility issues with the final step being the running of the accessibility check. When it comes to creating accessible web content, one of our team's favorite sets of tools is the WAVE online web service and browser extensions. WAVE stands for Web Accessibility Evaluation Tool. It's provided by the Web AIM organization. WAVE helps web developers and content creators make their content more accessible by providing visual feedback about its accessibility by presenting a web page with embedded icons and indicators. WAVE can't tell you if your web content is accessible, only a human can do that, but it can help you evaluate the accessibility of your web content and teach you a bit about accessibility along the way. Uh, WAVE is easy to use. To evaluate a page, you simply enter its address on the WAVE website or navigate to the page you want to check and select the WAVE icon in the Firefox or Chrome browser extension. WAVE then brings the underlying accessibility information of a page to the forefront so it can be evaluated in context. And that's what's depicted on this slide, uh, the accessibility information of a web page for a fictional university called Accessible University. This fictional uh, university web page was created to illustrate common accessibility problems and uh, WAVE has identified them here. WAVE will present your page with embedded icons and indicators, um, and each of those provides some information about the accessibility of the page. Um, in the left sidebar, summary shows the total number of errors, alerts, features, structural elements, HTML5 and ARIA elements, and contrast errors on the page. Selecting details represented by a red flag icon shows a full listing of all of the WAVE icons on the page. The documentation panel, represented by a blue eye information icon, provides an explanation of the WAVE icons and how you can make your page more accessible. So what the error or alert means, why it matters, how to fix it, the relevant uh, WCAG or Section 508 success criteria or guideline, and so on. And finally, the outline view allows you to see the heading structure of your web page so that you can verify that those headings that are so vital for structure and navigation are present and used correctly. I'm going to stop here so that we have time for some questions. Um, does anyone have questions or thoughts to share? Thanks, Melissa, so much for doing this. Um, there were a couple of questions that came in through the Q&A chat, um, and I'll moderate those for you now if you're ready. Yes. Okay, so uh, you talked about the 2.1, the new standards. How long do you think before they become um, the standards that everybody has to adhere to rather than 2.0? Oh, my goodness. Um, I can really only speak of my own experience at a large public university. <laughs> I know that it took us a long time to get our existing web resources accessibility policy into place. Um, I would imagine that it would take some time were we uh, to up update those to 2.1. However, most accessibility professionals I know are shooting for 2.1 anyway because it is backwards compatible, and that would be my guidance. 
know, even if uh, you're working in an environment in which 2.0 is sort of the law of the land, go ahead and, and shoot for 2.1 um, by ensuring that your content meets 2.1. You're also ensuring it meets 2.0 and you're future proofing yourself um, for when that is put into place. So I, your mileage may vary in terms of how long, um, but it doesn't hurt to go ahead and start using them. Okay, and then kind of a follow up to that one was, um, are there any online tutorials for the 2.1 guidelines? Is there anywhere that somebody can go and look and see what the differences between 2.0 and 2.1 are? Yes, there are um, a couple of really good resources that sort of address the guidelines in plain language, as well as um, some things that sort of provide a, a roadmap between one version and the other. Um, We'll have some sort of mechanism for providing the resources that I shared during the session and I'll make sure to include those. But yes, the short answer is yes. Um, another question for somebody who doesn't have an accessibility background like you do, how confident can they be using accessibility checkers? Is there, is that really just like kind of a first stop or should, should they be doing more if that is not necessarily in their job title, but they want to make sure that what they're doing is accessible? Can they rely on that accessibility checker or should they be doing striving for more? Oh, that's such a great question. So no automated checker can tell you if your content is accessible. Um, only a human can. So even those of us who do this work regularly or have some level of familiarity with it, um, it's not enough for us to rely on the automated testing. That said, that's, we have to start somewhere um, and that, that is where we start. So our process is to use an automated accessibility testing tool um, in our case, it's called AMP. That's an enterprise-wide tool um, that allows us to, in an automated way, evaluate the accessibility of multiple sites and pages at once. So we start with that um, and identify potential issues that way, but then we do some limited manual testing. And there are manual tests that content creators can do such as um, attempting to navigate a web page using the keyboard only or attempting to zoom a web page to see how the text resizes um, attempting to navigate a web page with the keyboard and seeing if there are visual indicators for where the focus of um, the cursor or mouse as it were is um, I'll be happy to provide some resources for that in the follow up as well. Off the top of my head, I know that there is um, a good resource for that provided by NCDAE. Um, don't remember what that acronym stands for, but the NCDAE Goals Project offers a series of accessibility cheat sheets. And one of them is simple web accessibility evaluation techniques, and those are appropriate um, for someone who creates content, not necessarily someone with a technical background. So um, my suggestion, start with the automated tools, um, do limited manual testing as you can. Um, ideally, we would all have access to um, a usability lab or a group of users with whom to do accessibility or usability testing. Um, to give us the entire picture, but um, realistically, I know that that not everyone has the ability to do that. But the combination of automated testing and limited manual testing is going to address um, most of the accessibility issues your users will come across, as will starting with valid semantic HTML and CSS. Okay, we have one more question here. Um, and you're kind of in a unique position at a major R1 university. And the question is, are there generally specific departments in academic institutions that oversee ADA compliance for print and online publications, such as newsletters? My experience is that varies widely across universities, whether or not there's staffing dedicated to that at all, and where in the university um, that initiative is housed. We happen to be housed in the Office for Information Technology. Um, in some places, that's an initiative that's associated with an Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. In others, it's associated with uh, disability services. Um, so my experience is that it does vary widely. 
and staffing levels very widely. Um, for example, our staffing is such that while we're able to provide training and support, we're not able to actually remediate documents for folks. Um, so if, if you, for example, were creating a newsletter and you were concerned about its accessibility, I would be able to evaluate that for you and uh, maybe do a one on one with you to sort of show you how an in InDesign or publisher, how you can take steps to make sure your future newsletters are accessible. But unfortunately, I wouldn't be able to uh, do that production work of, of fixing it for you. Other larger universities have invested in that and do have staffing um, to create accessible content or remediate content that's inaccessible. Um, so your mileage may vary. If you're interested in kind of exploring different models, um, Educause has done a little bit of work on that, kind of comparing um, how that's handled in different higher ed environments. And um, I'll try to find some references for that to share with our hosts. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you so much for this webinar. Uh, I'd like to thank everybody who attended today. Um, we hope to see you at our next continuing education event. Uh, don't forget that we will be sending you a link to the webinar recording as well. Um, I know there's a, another question that I need to answer in the q and I'll do that after we stop the recording. And uh, again, thank you so much, Melissa. We really appreciate your time. Thank you.